If you haven't heard already, I am here to shout it from the rooftops. Turning Point USA's biggest event of the year is right around the corner. America Fest is back, baby. It's the ultimate conservative get-together, and it's happening December 17th to the 20th here in beautiful Phoenix, Arizona. Oh, my gosh, if you've not been to Phoenix in December, oh, oh, what an amazing place to be. All the conservative figures you love will be there just so far. We've announced names like Candace Owens, Charlie Kirk, Steve Bannon, Tucker Carlson, Ali Stuckey, and Tim Poole. Great googly moogly, that lineup is juicy. And at the end of each day, there will even be live musical guests. There really is nothing like America Fest. Walk it around, Seeing all the people, hearing from your favorite speakers, everybody's all denimed out because it's like country concerts every night. You're going to learn so much about conservative ideas. Drop what you're doing. Go to AM Fest. That's amfest.com. Use my very special code POPLITICS to get 25% off your tickets. Sometimes I feel like I'm not a good enough Christian compared to others. And because of it, God is punishing me or keeping things from me. Do you relate at all? We hear all the time, you know, that, well, you shouldn't compare yourselves to everyone who seems to be on the perfect vacation, for example, or has the perfect wedding or perfect house that they're remodeling. But then there are the people who seem to be living the perfect Christian life. And we know that technically no one is perfect, but you get what I mean. Like, it can cause a lot of anxiety for me, and it steals my joy. Turns out, I'm not the only one, because my guest today became so aware of her own imperfections, specifically when it came to her Christian walk, that she created a space for people to find assurance that no matter what, none of us is perfect and we can all receive God's grace regardless of how many times we get things wrong. She's a mom, a wife, host of Confessions of a Crappy Christian podcast, and author of her brand new book, Confessions of a Crappy Christian, which just came out this week. If you couldn't tell, she's also a crappy Christian. No, I'm just kidding. She's also the one person person who is saying the thing that every single one of us is thinking, but, you know, keeping quiet about. She's so bold on social media. And we talk about in this episode problems within the Christian influencer space, which is very juicy, including how she was all in on Rachel Hollis before her crash and burn. We get into behind the scenes drama with both of our podcasts and the drama of guest booking and how to share the gospel in the easiest, most simple way. Please welcome Blake Gishay, aka the girl named Blake, to The Spillover. Blake, you have to spill a little bit about yourself. I kind of did a little bit in the intro, but like you have this whole brand called The Crappy Christian, which I think is fantastic. And I had to ask you, like when you were growing up, did you know a family that were like, we don't say crap in this house? Because I definitely knew some. No, I think we were that family. <laughs> now you're the crappy <laughs> Christian. <laughs> yeah, I think I, I mean, my parents will tell you now that it was it was a little legalistic growing up. It's not at all. They've kind of grown with us, which is nice. But I think I, I grew up in that home. So yeah, so yeah. tell me about the whole your whole brand, this concept of being a crappy Christian. Yeah, it's really it started in 2018. I was a new mom. Uh, I was kind of honestly starting to find my way onto the internet. And I have always kind of been a cut to the chase kind of person. Let's talk about the real things. I am notoriously terrible at small talk and shallow conversations. And I just found myself wanting when I came to specifically Christian female conversations that were happening online, they all just felt very flowery and they just didn't go into things like I was like, I had postpartum and I wasn't sure I wanted to be a mom after I was a mom and I was struggling with my faith. And so it kind of was a, if you can't find it, make it Mm -hmm. situation. Very much born out of the verses in second Corinthians where Paul's talking about God's grace being sufficient for you and, uh, his power being made perfect in weakness. And then for, therefore I will boast all the more in my weakness. And so it's kind of like, yeah, like I'm a crappy Christian. There are things I'm not great at. There are things I struggle with. I don't plan to like stay that way, but I'm going to be honest about it in the meantime. Well, when did you actually blow up on Instagram? Because it feels like out of nowhere, you just became this whole thing. Yeah. I, so Confessions of a Crappy Christian, the podcast was my 30th birthday present to myself in December of 2018, 2020. 
I decided to kind of rip the Band-Aid off, start talking politics and logistical like masks and vaccines and all of that kind of stuff. And it just it just blew up. Is it because you felt like there was a void in the Christian influencer space of females just not covering that stuff? Oh, there still is. But why is that, though? This is what's so frustrating to me. Yeah, we're just going to jump right in. I love that. Uh, <laughs> it's because people, I, I, there are a myriad of reasons, I think. I'm not going to speak for anyone, but I can tell you what made me afraid in the Christian influencer space to step into it was fear of backlash. Uh, cancel culture was at its finest and strongest, strongest at the time. And uh, there's that wasn't being modeled there weren't a lot of like pastors talking about it from the pulpit. So mm-hmm. we didn't have the tools to navigate this in a like quote unquote Christian context. But at the same time, I'm like, we're the ones that have, <laughs> we're the ones with the direct line to the person with the answers. Like why? Sh-? And I still two years in get people that are like, Christ- like stay in your lane, Christian, this is unchristian. I'm like, okay, like that's, it's fine if you want to feel that way. This is very, uh, I mean, unpopular and really going to ruffle feathers. But I have to say, so like when I, I was in pop radio before working for Turning Point USA and working in the conservative, you know, political space. Yeah. All right. So when I was doing that transition, I anticipated that I was going to get so much hate from the left. It has actually been the opposite. The most, the meanest stuff I get is honestly from like Christians online <laughs> that like nitpick stuff I do or Same. conservatives that, you know, you're not conservative enough or you're too conservative. That's the hate that I get. So Same. I always think about people like you or people like Ali Stuckey, um, big Christian influencers. And I'm like, how do you guys deal with the people that are always, I, I just feel like there is this group of the Christians that are just like, it's not good enough or you did this wrong or said this wrong. Yeah. It, I think there's a few different like groups that are, you know, like you said, there's the ones where, who you are as a Christian, too conservative for, too progressive for. I jokingly, my tagline is like too conservative for progressives, too progressive for conservatives. Yes, I get like, told the same thing. There are people right. on the far, far right that call me a liberal, which I think oh. is laughable. And then I have like people that are, you know, more moderate. They think I'm extreme. So it's yeah. just... But, but that's the thing. If you're showing up on the internet to try to make everybody happy, you're going to like, your hair is going to be falling out. You're going to be stressed out. Like you're just going to be, and it's not going to be fun. It's supposed to be, I mean, at least a little bit fun, right? Like, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I think it should be fun. And I think that is something in the conservative space and the Christian in, in space on social media anyway, of having that fun. I think John Christ was a really good pioneer of, you yes. know, putting comedy in that space and, and some other people. Ali does a bunch of satirical videos. You're doing that. You posted a reel last night of you waxing your husband's nose, <laughs> his nostrils or whatever, which was fantastic. It's just like fun entertainment stuff as well as deep conversations. But exactly. it's a good mix. And you do that on Confessions of a Crappy Christian podcast as well. Yes. Yeah. That is just this. Confessions of a Crappy Christian is like my pet project, right? We, It's my baby. It's where everything started. But it's also I get to... I'll be in five interviews a day and it'll be one on marriage and or dating. And we're talking about like porn and masturbation and yeah. all those things like impact. And then the next I'm having a conversation with a woman who has had three stillbirths and how God is still good in that. And it's very like serious and and like heartfelt. And that's just, I'm so ADHD. So that's the perfect job for me is just like, zinging around yeah and my my instagram is the same way i there's no cohesiveness it's just whatever pops in my brain and i feel like talking about that's what we're going to talk about that's exactly how i feel and i'm very curious because you and i are very similar in that way of uh at least kind of jumping around in different podcast topics like uh-huh. you if you're familiar with the spillover then you know like right. every week it's completely different so when you are picking your guests i'm very curious about your process like what do you do it because I'll say how what I do yeah we get and I'm sure you get so many requests we get so many requests that come well, you're, to- you brought up to me because I, I don't know what we did what we do post a repost a yeah. reel or something and then yeah. you're like hey by the way I'd love to do this bill over we we're like perfect because I get messages like that all the time I ignore 99.9 percent of them because they're just not yeah. actually going to be good gosh you know what I mean I'm sorry right. that's just like the truth but 100%. you were perfect we're like oh yes so you <laughs> worked out that way but usually yeah. I'm doing these weird deep dives and stuff yes. trying to discover unique guests so like do you pick yours or do you have a team that does I so we get a lot of pitches. I have a lot of 
being more in the book world, I do interview a lot of authors. I've over the last three years created these really strong relationships with publicists. And so I connect with publicists. They pitch me, you know, their roster essentially for the next set of launches. And we kind of go through and are like, yes, no, yes, 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 no. And then we book them out. I record super far out because I have two young kids and I don't want to be in here all the time. Yeah. And so I, I'm recorded like into December right now. Um, but yeah, I, I very rarely have to do a ton because those, those media kits and everything have like, I mean, it's somebody's biography essentially laid out in front of you. So we just get to kind of like go through them. That's so fun. I like picking the brains of other people that do this because, yeah. I, I mean, a lot of my guests are not podcasters. So I don't get to ask that question. So I was curious asking yeah. you. One thing that you've talked about a lot is um, like weakness as a Christian, I guess, and things that you struggle with or that don't come easy to you. What do you think that or what parts of Christianity would you say that you do especially imperfectly? Ooh, that's a really good question. <laughs> oh, I am not inherently kind. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I am. She's going to cut it. <laughs> right. Like I'm snarky. Uh, I'm sarcastic. I have to take my thoughts and my mouth captive a lot. Um, and I am. Uh, yeah, it's a work in progress. But I, my, what always has jumped to mind since I was a kid is like kindness and self-control. If we're talking fruits of the spirit, I'm pretty joyful. I'm pretty peaceful. I'm pretty patient. I can hang, but we get to like kind and I'm like, but I mean, I'd rather be funny. <laughs> Whenever it came out, like, it, did you fall into the trap for at least, I don't know, maybe you still really like it, but are you really into uh, like Enneagram and, and uh, personality tests or do you not do that? I do. Yeah. Okay. So do you find though that sometimes, cause I don't, but do you find that sometimes those can trap you, like make an excuse like, well, I'm a type seven or whatever. So like, it's okay for me to be kind yeah. of like, you know, smart, snarky to people. Right. So I'm an eight. I really in the Enneagram world, I actually like went through the process of uh, going through Enneagram coaching because God used the Enneagram to save my marriage. At one point we were like, on the brink of divorce, read the road back to you. And all of a sudden it just opened these doors for us to understand one another in a way we never had. Um, I very much see it as a tool, just like the five love languages or any other like worldly created tool that can come alongside the gospel. I, but there are definitely people who take it too far. I, in the Enneagram world and a, am a very prevalent voice of like, it is not an excuse to be a jerk or for bad behavior. It's not meant to put you in a box. It's meant to help you get out of the box. Um, I don't find that I lean on it or even talk about it as much now, just because I've not, I wouldn't even say I've outgrown it. It just, it was very impactful for me for a season. And now it's not as much, if that makes sense. Well, I um, am floored that you're saying that the Enneagram saved your marriage because so many Christians are very against the Enneagram. feel like it has right. ties to the occult and new age stuff. Right. Which none of that was really popular at the time. This was like 2019. So it hadn't gotten like the bad rap online that it has now. Um, you know, and I've, I've, had multiple people on my podcast that are Enneagram coaches and specialists. Uh, I've had Ian Morgan Crone who wrote The Road Back to You and is considered like the grandfather or the godfather of the Enneagram. Um, you know, I, I think Paul talks really openly about there are certain things that are going to be for some people and certain things that aren't. I don't mm. love the criminalization or like villainizing of the Enneagram that has happened within the Christian sphere, because it does to a degree kind of nullify the experiences that some people have had that like, I know for a fact that that was God, like God used this book. I will never forget reading the Enneagram one chapter and my heart breaking because someone was laying out on paper, these things about my husband that I now that I could see them, I couldn't unsee them. But mm -hmm. before they had just been like things that annoyed me or were like, you know, ones are very organized. And I was like, stop reloading the dishwasher after I load it. And it wasn't that he was doing that because he 
thought that I was a slob. It was because he just wanted to do it right. And he thought he was helping. And so I, it's whatever to me. I don't engage with, if it does come up on my platforms, I don't engage with people, honestly, that get all in a tizzy about it. Cause I'm like, I surely hope you're not like letting your kids watch, you know, the little mermaid because yeah, that's all like magic, anything like that. I hope you're not partaking in any of that because that's got some sketchy roots too. You know? And so I just think it's, it gets very like spec versus log. Like, yeah, like you do you, I'll do me. And like, we'll just leave each other alone. It's fine. What I love and find so compelling about you is um, you really do this very well of, of like clearly living a Christian life, but also um, making it seem very attainable, like being a Christian. And I feel like a lot of times, at least for me, I get very down on myself watching Christian influencers on Instagram and I compare myself to them and I look at my own life and I'm like, oh, I'm not a good enough Christian. Um, and that's really, that's something I really struggle with. And so what advice do you give people who find themselves going through those types of comparison struggles with other Christians? Well, I would first and foremost say you have no idea what's happening behind closed doors. Like, please. I mean, I know it's so cliche, but like Instagram is such a highlight reel. The Internet is such a highlight reel. Even me, someone who shows up maybe a little bit like more organically and authentically, you're still only seeing what I choose to show you, you know, so anything that you see, it's still curated. It's still intentional. Um, getting into the like, quote unquote, Christian influencer space was such a shock. How so? Uh, so many of the people weren't who I thought they were. Like, what did you notice? What did you see that was really well, I mean, shocking? People were saying they would do, you know, like, let's say when I first got started and was smaller, you know, more in the like 20,000s and was working on my book proposal and was just kind of this little baby, like, figuring it out and people were like, would like, oh, oh yeah. Like, like offer to do things and then like totally ghost me mm. or, or they would ask to come on my show to promote their book and then like fo and follow me and we'd be talking and then the episode would come out and they'd like disappear. Holy cow. Can I just tell you that this is one of my number one pet peeves and now we've talked about this. So now, <laughs> so now I know that you won't do this, but it hurts no. my feelings so much. The amount, but like, let me tell you, like when we can discuss this as podcasters, so we understand this. So for other people that don't know, like there have been times we have flown out guests, like we're, we're a nonprofit. Okay. We are raising money to get this money. We fly out a guest, put them up in a hotel, whatever, do all this stuff. I take them to dinner. I'm researching on them. I'm doing my prep work, prep work on this interview. I have uh, team members on my staff that have kids that are taken away from their families to edit this episode, put it out, all the things, okay? You know this. And then nothing. They don't post it even on their story. They don't even like it, comment, nothing. I'm like, dude, I just promoted the heck out of whatever your project whatever is. you're promoting. Or right. just you in general. And like, are you right. kidding me? It just, it's rude. It is. It's, it is. I, I will say as someone who is right now on the digital press tour for my book, I am doing so many interviews, but I, and probably because I have the podcaster background, it just takes an ounce of intentionality. Yes. So what we did is like my team made a spreadsheet and every podcast interview I'm doing is going in that spreadsheet and when it's going to air gets put in there. And then we made a little line of tick boxes so that I make sure I share every single one from big ones like yours to these like sweet girls who are exactly where I was three years ago. And yeah. are just excited that somebody will come on their show. No, I'm going to promote that. I'm going to promote this. It takes intentionality, but like, just don't be a jerk. Like, do you know who Heather McDonald is? She hosts the uh, podcast Juicy Scoop. She's like a comedian yeah. and it's a pop culture show. Is she the one that like passed out? Yes. 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 Okay. She's the one that kind of like made that really crass like comment yeah, about like, God, I'm like, God's favorite. She struck her down. Yes. Yeah. yeah I got yes. the vaccine and I'm God's favorite and like nothing will happen to me. And then boom, she like faints right. on stage. Okay. So yeah. that chick, what's interesting, I love Heather McDonald. Like I didn't agree with that. Call. I was there in the crowd, by the way, when that happened. Stop. Yes. Because that was in Arizona. <laughs> so I was at the show. Hit the Ground, like it was scary. Bounced. We were, That's we, terrifying. it was really terrifying, like being there. But anyway, she has said on her podcast before that um, when she has invited guests on and then they don't promote the episode and stuff, that she tells them, You're never coming back on again and like reaches out to them and is like, Screw you, you're not coming back. <laughs> and I was like, Dang, I told my team, I was like, Should we be that cutthroat? And I was like, No, I'm too nice. I'm too well, scared. Okay, so, but this is another arena of like, because I'm a Christian, I'm supposed to just like roll over and take it. Right. I'm supposed to just be like, it's fine. Like, no, 
I there is mm, how much tea do I want to spill? All of it. There there is a very prevalent Christian influencer who, when I was smaller, reached out. Her team asked to come on my show. I lost my mind. I was so excited, like so excited. Followed me on Instagram at the time. I have like twenty thousand followers, so now I'm big like, deal. Oh, this is, this is happening. We have this really great conversation. Like I'm gonna promote the heck out of her inter- her interview. The day before her interview comes out, my team always emails the day before, sends like assets and links and stuff like that. Homegirl unfollows me on Instagram, (gasps) never promotes the episode. What? Why do you think she unfollowed you for that? It could be because I was like, had oh, this was pretty long after I had started talking politics. So she she would have known what she was getting into at the time. But I was, it was so upsetting. Like this person, especially somebody that I'd looked up to and like revered it. That was a rude wake up call. Yes. That is so sad. And it probably was sharing politics. Okay. So like, this is the thing though. People talk about how, you know, Christian women, we need to not get in that sphere with, you know, politics. It's too controversial. It's too polarizing. It pushes people away from Christianity. What do you have to say about that? I think anything can push people away from Christianity. Like who I am as a person could push push people. Like it's this idea. I I don't know. I think we've gotten this idea that we have to be for everybody. And I'm like, Jesus wasn't (laughs) like Jesus wasn't for everybody. Everybody didn't love him. No, that's, I, that is not a standard I'm willing to try to live up to because what that's going to require of me is watering myself down, changing what I'm passionate about, changing what I'm gifted at. Like I was pre-law. Like I, this is what I love. I've always loved this. Why am I supposed to put that on a shelf and let it gather dust because it makes you uncomfortable? Well, on that note, I mean, what is what do you think it really looks like to love your neighbor? Because people might hear that word and they think like, you know, OK, I'm not going to love someone I disagree with, like how I love my family and friends. Like if it's just a person I know, you know, some mom in my kid's dance class or whatever, I don't have to put up with them. I'm just not going to talk to them or whatever. So if the Bible tells us to love others, what do you think that looks like practically for a Christian? Well, loving and agreeing were, are have never been synonymous. Look, my husband's out there. I don't agree with him. Like, <laughs> we've been married for 10 years. He's my favorite person on the planet. We don't agree about everything. So I, I genuinely can't wrap my mind around this idea that if you disagree with someone, that means you don't love them because that's what it gets thrown at as Christians. Like, because I th- I do believe that homosexuality is a sin, just, just like I think having sex before you get married is a sexual sin. Yes. They are the same in the eyes of God. Yes. Just like, that means I don't love you. That that's insane. Like that. I don't understand why this is such a hard concept for people to grasp. I think it's an identity issue. So when you've made your identity, something about you, if you have made your identity, your let's stick with this, you know, example, homosexuality. Well, then it sounds like, I hate you because you have made this your identity Mm. when the reality is the only thing your identity was meant to be found in is being the image of God. It's powerful. And I look like I'm, I am, uh, have done this before of like, you know, these little idols start to crawl into your life and you've all of a sudden placed your identity in it and then it gets threatened and you want to lash out and you're super offended that's a really good heart check for me. If somebody says something to me, well, mine or in real life, and it offends me like deeply, I, I may need to check where that's sitting in my life because it maybe has gotten above the most important thing. Do you think that you can be blunt and Christ-like at the same time? Like is 100%. Those go together? 100%. I mean, again, Jesus literally called Pharisees like whitewashed tombs, which he was like, you're dead inside. Like you're dead inside. You look really pretty on the outside, but you're ugly on the inside. He called them a brood of vipers, which was essentially the, you know, version of a you're a snake. You know, like everybody uses like the snake emojis online or whatever. So I mean, I don't think, but it's all about where it's coming from, right? Like if my heart is to hurt your feelings, Mm. then no. My heart is to tell you the truth because I love you, and sometimes the truth is uncomfortable. And yeah, 100%. Yeah, it's all about intentions. Yeah. 
Not to call anyone out, but also to call everyone out, buying clothes from those garbage quality fast fashion brands has got to stop. We are wasting so much money on Chinese brands whose values don't align with ours, and they aren't transparent about their labor practices or about what's being used in their materials, not to mention everything falls apart after two wears. And don't even get me started on the shoes. It feels like you're walking on cardboard. We are in a major boot moment right now, and Christina Lombardi happens to be a luxury footwear and accessories brand that is designed in the U.S. and manufactured in Italy. She creates her shoes at family-run factories with the highest quality and craftsmanship there is, the same factories as many, by the way, as the large fashion houses. Christina Lombardi is a conservative shoe designer in a sea of far-left contemporaries. On Christina-Lombardi.com, you'll find a range of styles from classically chic flats, which are also making a comeback very excited, to trendy combat boots, all sourced from Italy. These are real designer shoes with quality you can see and feel. And the best part is knowing that with every step you take in them, your money didn't go towards leftist cause you don't believe in. I've worn her designs many times on my Daily Show Poplitics and to fancy gala events, and now you can too. You can take $100 off any order of Christina Lombardi products and 30% off Marketplace products at Christina-Lombardi.com with code Alex. That's Christina-Lombardi, L-O-M-B-A-R-D-I dot com with code Alex for $100 off any order and 30% off Marketplace products. We're new boot goofing today. Okay, so let's go through like a couple Christian basics. Okay, so let's just pretend someone is listening to this that's not a Christian. They're intrigued by this conversation. They're intrigued by the idea of like, oh, there's a crappy Christian. Like that's, you can be that. Like, because I'm scared to just go all in. I feel like I'm not good enough. Kind of the thing I talked about. Um, How would you describe Christianity to somebody that doesn't know anything about it? Um, And if you've never read the Bible, where should somebody start? Yeah, absolutely. So Christianity is based in the belief that the son of God, who is also God, came to earth, lived a perfect life, um, did miracles, saved people, uh, was unrightfully, well, accused of saying that he was the son of God and he was not willing to budge on that because it was the truth. Uh, And so they put him on a cross, which was the most horrific death you could die at the time. Uh, He was buried, dead for three days, resurrected, walked around, saw people. It is historically accurate and and verified, right, verified, Um, and then ascended to heaven so that the Holy Spirit, which is the third part of the Trinity, could come and dwell within those who believe in Jesus Christ. And so... So much of the Christian walk has been convoluted to be about stopping sinning or living a perfect life when the reality is Jesus gave a very clear command uh, at the the Last Supper before he was crucified, and it was love others as I have loved you and love God above everything else. And so it all starts and ends with love. And yes, sometimes that love is going to be uncomfortable. Sometimes it is going to tell you things that you don't like. Happens to me all the time. Uh, But it is the only religion that does not require anything of you but faith. Mm. Uh, It is the only religion that doesn't want you to, it actually doesn't want you to dress yourself up, make yourself look more perfect, get it all together check all of these checks off of a list. It literally is believing that he was the son of God, that he lived a perfect life, died, battled, defeated our sins, rose from the grave. And now we live our life to bring as many people to the foot of the cross as possible so that they can live out of abundance and grace and hope that is only available through him. The best place to start is Romans, in my opinion. It's a really, really clear picture of grace versus law and the burden that we are not under and how much of the pressure is off um, and how much the cross and Christ really accomplished. How do you think Christians can approach praying both for God's will, 
while also praying for the things that they desire in their heart. Like, yeah. I really want to be a mom, but I don't know if that's God's will for me. You know, one day I talk about that all the time. So is it okay to pray and say things like, hey, God, I hope this happens? Or do you think no? Oh, yeah, 100%. So I think we have a misunderstanding of what God's will is. Uh, scripture tells us that God's will is, again, for us to love others and love him. Um, and he also gave us like free will and decision making abilities. Um, and so I think people get people get paralyzed out of a fear of stepping outside of his will. And I just think that that's a, a really interesting uh, place to live, to think that your will is more powerful than his and like more sovereign than his. Um, and so for using your example of really wanting to be a mom, like God knows you and he knows your heart and he knows those things already largely because he created you that way. Like he created not all women get to be mothers, but you do have this innate maternal desire and like subconscious that's always, you know, just like men were created to lead mm -hmm. and, you know, be the head of the home. And so like, God's not surprised. He's not annoyed. Like, look, I want my book to sell really well because I poured my heart and soul and tears and time into it. I, God's not like, like, really? Like, come on. No, like he knows I worked really hard and that I was obedient in writing the book. And so like, I think we have this image of God as he's like sitting on this really like pristine gold throne. And he's like, Bleh. like they're annoying and they're getting on my nerves. Like, can somebody escort them out? <laughs> I'm like, He's our dad. Like there's, you know, there are verses that talk about like, do you who are evil, not like give good gifts to your kids. There are people who don't love Jesus that are really great parents, mm -hmm. like really incredible parents. How much better is God, right? At like giving his kids good gifts. And it may not always be what you think you want, but it's what you think you want, not what he has for you. Okay, here's a juicy story I've never told. Oh, yes. I dated a guy for a couple months, years ago, and he had been engaged, okay? So they're engaged. They had a, ch a home church. They're going through premarital counseling. His fiance has an affair with the pastor doing their premarital counseling. So they break up. He obviously experiences severe uh, distrust in the church, a falling out with his faith, yada, 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 everything you can imagine, of course. So for people, that is an extreme story. It is a real story, somebody I know. Yeah. For yeah. people, though, that experience church hurt, what is your advice for people who are like, man, I just wish that I could get my walk back on track, but mm -hmm. I just, it pains me to go back to the church. The church hurt me. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, so the church has hurt me <laughs> like a lot. Uh, you were saying earlier, first of all, the mo most disgusting messages I get are typically from Christians. Um, but in like real life, I've had actually write in my book about three different, like the three probably most hurtful things that have happened to me in my Christian walk of the last 12 years were all by Christians <laughs> within the church body that I was actually attending. Um, and so I get it. I get being burned and I get being kind of like, did you have to change churches or are you going to the same place? Once we did. We did change churches once. Um, and then we've stayed. We love the church that we're at right now. But that's kind of, I think some part of the problem is that like people hurt you. Like God didn't. Mm. You know, like that pastor made a really bad decision and and was lacking discernment and wisdom big time. And so was the fiance. But that was people, not God. And scripture is really clear about the importance of community, of believers gathering together and the power when two or more are gathered. And so I think no one misses out more than you when you completely step away from the church. And I get it. I mean, we had a really, and I talk about it in my book, like horrific, uh, like it still makes my stomach drop like situation happened with a church that we had been in for a really long time and walking out of that sanctuary and knowing I probably would never go back in the moment. I remember getting in the car and being like, I'm I don't think I'll ever go to church again. It feels like it. going through a heartbreak. It is. It is like heartbreak. Isn't just romantic <laughs> people. Friends break up. 
friends break churches. up, churches, working relationships. But I think it's just really important to remember that that was people that hurt you. And that does not delegitimize the pain. But like, talk to God about it. And he'll probably be like, yeah, they acted like idiots. They're still my kids. But like, that was messed up. You know what I mean? Crappy Christian hot take. Should women be in leadership positions in the church? Okay, I don't have like a crazy strong opinion on this. I know this is something that some women in the church get like really fired up over. I do think that the verses that are largely heralded to keep women out of leadership positions are taken out of historical context. Um, I've done my own like deep dives into what Paul's talking about. And, you know, he says that women should be quiet. Well, it was because there was like a habitual like gossiping talking during the meetings problem like he, we have to remember that like Paul was writing to specific groups of people in these books but at the same time like it's obviously in the bible for a reason but i don't know dude i'm like he made adam and eve like equal he didn't say like he didn't say even in the curse like even when they got kicked out of the garden he wasn't like you get to preach you don't <laughs> You yeah, but I, mean? I feel like women are, are called, I, I feel like uh, women are supposed to be presiding over other women or children, and then it's just we shouldn't, like, pastor men. Do you agree with that, or you still think, eh, I'm not do sold? You, how do you feel? I, I don't think that women should be in pastoral positions in the church, above other men. Above other men, Correct. I would agree with. Uh, in I leading agree a children's that. ministry, leading a women's ministry, that's fine. I don't think, yeah. like, pastoring the whole church on a Sunday with men and women in there, I don't think that's right. Personally. Do you think women sh- that like America's ready for a woman president? Holy cow. Now you're giving me a hot take, Blake. Okay. Here's what I think. Yeah. I'm going to get canceled. <laughs> I do not think that America is either. ready for a, a female president yet. I'm not saying it won't ever happen. No, yeah. um, I don't think that we're ready for it yet. I don't either. I don't think that they would be elected conservative or liberal. I don't I feel think the same way. I don't think so either. And I just and honestly, I hate that. Like, honestly, I just uh, lately my hot take is that I've kind of started thinking maybe it wouldn't be a good idea. Okay, now I'm definitely canceled. Now I'm really canceled. <laughs> and everybody <laughs> hates us now. Now everybody hates us. I think that like I, I agree. I do agree with you. Like as much as I'm pro woman and think gr- you know girls are great, I don't like. I don't want to be president. I don't I, want to be the ho- I don't want to be the head of my household. It's either. hard because you think of p- like amazing people like Candace Owens, Kaylee McEnany, or like okay, you know, w- but we love women like that. And I'm like, I do too. I just don't know if I want them to be president. But yeah. now I'm really gonna get labeled like I have internal we can cut all sexism or whatever. <laughs> but no, it's good. I love it. It's very juicy. I don't ever get asked juicy questions myself. Usually, I'm asking them. So that's great. Okay, so um, one last thing before we get into your book because I really want to you told us a little bit but I want to know more you've talked about this before how do you feel like girl boss and like hustle culture takes away from the message of Jesus oh it it stands completely in the face of everything that Jesus is about first of all can we just stop saying girl boss and just hate it be a boss it's over I've talked about it before too yeah like I'm not a mompreneur I'm an entrepreneur I'm not a girl boss like I'm I'm the boss like I don't have to stick girl in front of it. That's just me. I don't mean that rudely. Maybe, maybe a little bit, but like, anyway, my like original entrance into the internet was hustle culture and like talking about it because I was coming out of it. I like lived in it, uh, like 2018, 19, fully under the influence of very, of a very popular, um, influencer who like wrote books and then had a very spectacular crash and burn. Uh, Ooh, I'm trying. I'm racking my brain. Who could oh, she be can, talking about? Who it is? I don't it's Rachel know. Hollis. Oh yes. Oh yeah. Wait. Can, do we have to beat this out, or can we talk about her? Oh, I don't care. Yeah. Okay. Care. The Rachel. The Rachel Hollis rise and fall was absolutely edge of your seat stuff on the it. internet during that time. I was at Rise LA. So I went to like flew from Louisiana to LA to go to Rise in 2019. I was on her book launch team for Girl Wash Your Face. I mean, I was all Whoa. in. Oh yeah, all in. And I ended up in adrenal failure because <laughs> my body was like, <laughs> I can't do this. 
I was just working myself to absolute death trying to train for a marathon. I am 5'2". I'm built like a Mack truck. I wasn't meant to run. And I was like, <laughs> Rachel Hollis said we need to like train for marathons. So I was like trying to train for a marathon. I ended up at a actual doctor with the doctor going, I don't know how you're standing up right now. Like, oh my gosh. Horrible. So wait, she was paying you or what? No, 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 no. It was like oh, an influencer God. thing. Like I was just all in. Yeah. Like, yeah. Just, okay. Like, you were just a fan. in. Yeah. Right. Oh, yeah. No. Like I was just completely bought in. Listen, the day that I start telling cute conservatives, everybody, we're signing up for marathons. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. They know that I've gone off the deep end. My fall She's, is coming. Alex has lost it. Like, <laughs> yeah. Or, yeah. Just the whole, it was just so toxic. It was yeah. very sad. And I just mm. still am trying to figure out, okay, did she knowingly uh, kind of swindle her way into the Christian movement because she was like, hey, this is a good market to tap into that'll buy books and women that are going to like really buy into inspirational messaging? Or did she get categorized as Christian when she wasn't even trying to do that? No, I, the first time I ever went viral online, it was because I came out and said, Rachel Hollis built her business on the backs of Christian women and then turned around and said, I don't need them anymore because I did what I needed to do and did a full 180 and changed her whole message. I'm snapping my fingers. Yes. Yes. Uh, I mean, I haven't I haven't talked about her in forever, but going back to your original question of hustle culture, there are literally quotes on Pinterest that are like no one is coming to save you. You have to save yourself. You have to do it yourself. No. We can't we save ourselves. Came. It's already done. I don't want to save myself. I don't want to pull myself up by the bootstraps. I am tired. Like, I just want to rest and walk in obedience. Hustle culture is so toxic. It's, I hate it. What is your advice for the woman who says, I have literally no idea what I'm doing or where I'm going? Speaking of that. Yeah. Um, I think it would be, do, do you, do you have to be going somewhere right now? Mm -hmm. Like, can where you are right now be Okay. Because I didn't quote unquote go anywhere until I got okay with where I was. When I was in the the height of the Rachel Hollis hustle, like it is the cringiest thing in the world, but I like wanted to be an influencer. I wanted to be an influencer and I was killing myself trying to do it and nothing was happening. And when I kind of had my own crash and burn, you know, her, her messaging started, to, I mean, I, I was idolizing Rachel Hollis and her messaging started changing and I started being like, ooh, mm okay, wait, like we're going off the rails a little bit, kind of jumped off the train. God used that as a huge wake up call. And then I let it all go. I was, I wasn't on Instagram. I wasn't doing anything. This is like early 2018. Yeah. I don't want anything to do with any of it. Really focused on my babies and my home and my husband. And then right before my 30th birthday, literally God was like, you should start a podcast. And I was like, whoa, hold on. <laughs> <laughs> we just did this like we just agreed that this wasn't what we were gonna do and then the podcast blew up and that's been the ride ever since so I think my advice to women is always like get okay where you are so that if God does go and like takes you somewhere else you're good like you've got a good head on your shoulders you're level but also like you're gonna have to work and take steps of obedience as well so, okay, and the book is going to be called Confessions of a Crappy Christian as well, right? Same name as the podcast? Yes. Yep. Okay, so you told us that you're going to go through some of your moments of church hurt. What else is in this book and, and what inspired you to write the book? Uh, I actually, my publishing house found me on Instagram and we're like, hey, do you want to write a book? You're joking. And so it was, I probably wouldn't have written a book. Otherwise, I had these like bones of a proposal that were just kind of sitting somewhere. And the book is completely different than the the original conception of it that was really old and outdated. Um, but it's essentially. Is it like a coffee table book or like a memoir type of book? It's like a memoir, but very applicable. It's okay. not a coffee table book. It's very like, I'm going to tell you what happened to me and I'm going to tell you what God did, what he, how he used it, what he taught me. The whole, like the heart behind it is just setting people free because I lived in so much bondage for a really long time of like fear and shame and insecurity and, and not understanding. And so as I've grown and God has showed me these things, I feel a very like 
come like, see, taste, like he's so much better than you think he is. And so my hope is that the book just serves as like, I know when I read books by women that I resonate with, that I'm like reading it and I can see myself in the stories, then it's easier for me to take that application and actually do something with it. So originally when I wrote it, it was a lot more teaching and my publishers were like, you didn't write about yourself at all. And I was like, well, I don't want it to be about me. And they were like, but that's what people relate to. Like people are going to buy it because they want to relate to you. So it's got some, some gut wrenching stories in there. For so sure. who's, who's the ideal person that you imagine being like the perfect person to read this book? For, for me, it's people kind of like you were saying earlier who have like maybe like tiptoed with Christianity that or, or have been burned by it and kind of opted out. I mean, it's absolutely for like the firm believer and the woman who like lives her life for Christ. But my hope is that it reaches the people kind of, you know, more like around the outsides that are maybe intrigued by someone calling themselves a crappy Christian. And they're like, wait, like this girl's not saying she's perfect and better than me. Like that's, I would read that, you know, and that they can see themselves in it and, and realize that like, God didn't change. He is still good. He is he is still faithful. Either religion or people have somehow convinced you otherwise. When is this book coming out? When can we get our hands on it? It's actually out. Uh, so you can get it at all the places you get your books. Uh, it's Confessions of a Crappy Christian. It's all the places. And what's your Instagram for people that have not followed you yet? The girl named Blake. The girl named Blake. Awesome. Blake, thank you so much for coming on The Spillover. Thank you for having me. This was so much fun. I'm glad you reached out and were like, hey, I should come on. (laughs) Well, my followers were being very aggressive about it. They were like, are you going to go on The Spillover? Like you and Alex would be, y'all are like the same person. And so I was like, yeah, I'm going to shoot my shot. I love it. We'll have to like hang out in person sometime. uh, You got to come to a Turning Point USA event. You would love it. I need to. I need to. Good talking with you, Blake. You too. Blake is such a breath of fresh air. This episode was just really a blast, like talking to a friend, honestly. And I am stoked to add her book to my bookshelf. If you liked this episode and you're really interested in more faith-based episodes that I've done, go back and listen to season one, episode 26 with Christian sexpert, Francie Winslow, all about how to have an incredible Christian sex life. I call her the Christian, call her daddy. You'll also really like my episode with Eric Metaxas I did last month about the role the church should play when it comes to speaking on cultural and political issues. We just launched our new division, Turning Point Faith, at Turning Point USA, where we encourage churches across America to get involved in our elections and to speak up to win the culture war that we're up against. To support Turning Point Faith or see how your church can get involved, go to tpfaith.com. The Spillover is back next Thursday at 9 p.m. Pacific, midnight Eastern on Apple Podcasts and Spotify, and you have the option to watch every every single episode in visual form on YouTube or Rumble. Just go to Poplitics on YouTube or just search for The Spillover on Rumble and subscribe. I'm Alex Clark, and this is The Spillover. Love you. Mean it. Bye. Bye.